Greetings, my people and my relatives. This is Nehije, Our Voices, Indigenous Solutions Podcast. And I'm so excited today to interview my dear sister, Karen Rodriguez. And we have met through our work in, you know, soil regeneration work. We've done a few projects, uh, even some animation projects together, getting indigenous food systems out there in the world and teaching people about the vast, beautiful history of native food systems. Um, And also, I've come to know a little bit about her beautiful story. So you, uh, you went back to Guatemala recently. You you decided to leave Los Angeles and go back home. Um, first question is, had you ever been back home before? And second question is, you know, why did you go back home this time? Yeah, I started to visit Guatemala when I was around 21 uh, is when I got my legal paperwork here in the States and so was able to start to travel there. And so I got to know um, my family members and it was the most beautiful thing because it was the first time I went somewhere with it where everyone looked like me. Uh, in the States, I don't have that experience. Uh, it's hard to shop for clothes. It's not made for me, um, etc. And so it was really incredible to see like 60 family members who looked just like me. And it was really, really sweet. I fell in love with all of them. And I started to go around the country and just to seeing the richness in nature, it gave me a sense of something that I definitely was missing growing up, but also just felt like a part of me. And it's like insane volcanoes, lush green jungle, water everywhere. Um, And it just felt so sacred and so precious and so um, uh, regal. And it was something I recognized. And so I was able to visit a a good five times uh, in my life. Uh, I didn't know that I would live there in my lifetime, but I knew that there was a calling to be there as often as I could. And then every time I went, I found myself staying longer. And what happened this time was that I actually was able to pinpoint it last night. I was thinking about this, but I went to Chile for one of the cops and it was the cop is the environmental summit and it was moved at the last minute, but I decided to stay in Chile in solidarity with the country. It was going through upheaval and I wanted to sort of show up and, and I did that. So I got the opportunity to spend time with the Mapuche tribe in the very south of Chile. And one of the elders said in in her talk, she said, if you if you stray too far from the soil you were born on, there's a tendency to get really lost. And I remember that that stayed with me and awakened something in me, a memory that I was like, oh, I'm really far from the soil I was born on. And so when we went through COVID as a society and and sort of all of the uh, racial justice upheaval or finally really being able to talk about things that we hadn't, um, I just felt really clear that I, if I was to stay in the work of system change or uh, food system change or um, you know equity, the things I care about, that I also had to get really good at taking care of myself and that I don't have access to that in this country. For me, in the city, it feels really hard to do that, to do all of that. So um, it was a mixture of things that just definitely were, I was always headed in this direction, but it really happened very fast. I woke up one day, um, actually on Halloween, and my birthday is November 1st, which is celebrated as the Day of the Dead in in Guatemala. Um, And so I woke up those days and just had a wild energy in my soul. And I, I wasn't sure what it was. It was quite confusing. But on the morning of my 39th birthday, I woke up and called my mom and was just like, can I move to Guatemala? Like, this is something that's come up. I'm ready to go. And she was lovely and supported me. And like, then, can you go to your yeah, can I go to, house? Yeah, my grandfather's house that he left for us. Mm-hmm. And she's like, yeah, it's your house. Just go. And, um, and, so in the three hours that I took to decide to uh, 
move my uproot my life um I, I then had to call, you know, the people I work with and, and decide if it was going to work. And then I spent the next month moving completely out of a house I'd lived in for 10 years and um, just, yeah, uprooted. And it, I kept saying, it's like when your plant needs a new pot and the roots are just too bound together and it needs to move. It needs a bigger pot. And that's how it felt to me. Like I needed a different <laughs> pot uh, in order to really grow in a, in the way that I'm intended to. Um, and so, yeah, it was moved by refining that part of myself or my original root, um, especially because as we explored as a society, these topics of race and uh, inequities, system, oppression, um, just the horrific things that have happened, um, I really felt like I could see my own colonization for the first time very clearly and then was sitting there with it. Like, and I said to Lila June, it felt like it was a, like a piece of, like a vegetable or like a root vegetable in the side of my face. And then if I ripped it out too quickly, I could take my whole brain with it. And then that would leave me in a place of just completely not knowing who I am. You're afraid to lose a part of your identity because it's so much of who you are that if it's gone, then who are you? What are you? Um, and I just found that really profound when you said that, that you were willing, uh, or even needing to, to, to pull out and uproot this colonial identity that was formed in, you know, Los Angeles area and, and just start new. I mean, I know it wasn't completely new cause you'd been home a few times, but it just takes a lot of courage to do that. And I just want to acknowledge the the amount of faith it takes to step into that kind of void. The other driver too is um, that when COVID happened, I felt like everyone seemed to n- know or think that they knew what was happening. And I don't have friends that are scientists or, or vaccine scientists or doctors. And I heard, you know, 20 versions of the story So I felt like, why does everyone have trouble when I say I don't know what's happening? Mm. And why does that cause such a stir when I keep saying, no, I still don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. What the pandemic means. Yeah, what what happened, what it was, where it came from, like the whole thing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I still today don't know. And, And I think that I just felt like, what happened to humility? What happened to the humility of, I don't know, this is grand, it's huge, it's much bigger than me, so I don't know, and being okay with that. Mm -hmm. And so I felt also like, not only like, where's the humility, but also that we're not good in the unknown. Mm-hmm. We're, a, we're a society who does not like that. Mm-hmm. We have phones in our hands that give us an answer immediately. And we're always waiting for that. And we're used to that. Mm-hmm. So I just felt like I need to get better in the unknown. I need to get better at taking care of myself. And I really am craving humility. And and what is what does that mean? What does that look like? And I know that in Guatemala, like I said, there there's a richness in nature and a richness in, in the humanity. There's not a lot of money and there's not a lot of anything. I, I get water on Wednesday and Friday. So uh, mm-hmm. I knew that it would help me to go there, mm-hmm. to, to start to make that space um, of the unknown. And I, and I call it like space for God too, like... I felt like I needed to create that space where where creator exists and like mm-hmm. that creative space where it's not survival anymore because all I learned in this country was how to survive mm-hmm. and I got pretty good at it quote unquote but I didn't want to live like that anymore mm-hmm. so I needed to make that space again where God guides more than my own generating um, because that's not yeah, that, cr- that creative space is where we 
thrive. That's where our nature is. It's like we are like the trees and like the bees and like the flowers if we can have that space where it's just us and God. And I felt like I had lost that here. So in the act of moving to Guatemala, you are stepping into, deliberately stepping into the unknown as an act of humility. Yes. And I can tell you that I cried every single day of my first month. Um, and not out of defeat or not out of grief. It was, it was really being present to, I don't know how to do things here. Everything is uphill. I'm a city girl and I get to like stop doing that. And, um, you know, everything's done manually. There's no, you know, we, we are so spoiled in this country. We can have things very fast in our hands and yeah, just really, really getting humble to, I don't know anything, you know, I'm but a grain of sand in this world and can I make that space again in order to sort of, yeah, really root in, really root in. Can you tell the story that you told me yesterday about, you know, this time when the creator caught you when you had nothing? Yeah. You know, like I, w- I thought that was such a, and, and, and how you, how that instructed your decision to go to go back to Guatemala. Yeah. So when I say space for God, this is what it means to me. I was 19 years old. Um, I had an altercation at home. It was it was a moment I just didn't feel safe in my home, and I decided that I the best thing I could do was leave. And I didn't have a green card, and I didn't have a job, and I didn't have money, and I didn't have anything. But I decided that I was safer leaving the house and just taking my little warm parka. And my only thought was to go. I didn't have a plan. (laughs) And I had no money. Um, But I just, I knew that I wanted to be safe. That was the most important thing to me. So I got on the bus. Uh, It's a 45-minute ride from uh, the inner city of L.A. to the beach. But the beach is where I've always felt most safe because uh, the ocean's my mother. So I just, I just got on the bus. And for the first 20 minutes, I was like talking myself into, all right, you're going to be warm on the beach. It's going to be okay. Like, um, you know, uh, thinking of what corner to go be in, uh, you know, the beach is big, but there's certain parts that have more, more trouble. So, um, just kind of having that moment and really not really kind of formulating my beach plan. That was really it. Uh, at 19, you know, you don't have a lot of <laughs> arsenal, you don't have a lot of tools. So I was like, I'll just go sleep on the beach. Uh, and 20 minutes into the ride, my friend Emily calls me and she's like, hey, what are you doing? Um, and she says, my mother is sick in Spain and I have to go for three months. And can you please come watch my dog and my fish and my plants? And, you know, you'll just live here. And I literally, I, I just... I just felt God just swoop in in that moment. And those three months helped me live not only in a really beautiful home, uh, safe, and I got my job and I, you know, I got my first apartment after that. And it was just, it was that cliche thing of like leap and the net will appear and really getting to experience that. Um, you know, I used to cliff jump a long time ago off, um, you know, just different into different bodies of water. And I always knew that my, the, the space between my fear and my faith was only about six inches, uh, big (laughs) because as soon as I could jump, there was a freedom and a liberation that I, Mm. it didn't matter what happened. You know what I mean? And that space is pretty beautiful. And, and so I knew that I needed to find that again because what happened in the time of from 19 to now I'm going to be 40 next month is was a lot of survival and a lot of learning that mechanism of, okay, I got to survive, got to survive, next thing, next job, I next thing, I can do it, I'm going to create it, I'm going to generate it, I'm supposed to, I have to, uh, it gives me my value to... And then I looked around, and while I have a really lovely and dynamic life, 
I knew that for longevity and for my elderhood and for the future of my life and my contribution, that I needed to get better at being in that space. And that if we're to heal as a humanity, we have to work better in that creative space. And letting the creator provide for you. And letting creator move us. So so going to Guatemala was just like, okay, creator. Yes. Uh, catch me. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So this is interesting to me because, you know, what I heard, you know, at you as a Maya woman, um, what I heard from other Maya elders is that, you know, there was these massive cities, right? Um, these amazing Mayan metropolises way before Columbus was ever born, right? It's like extraordinary astronomy, linguistics, spiritual sciences, architecture, like insane, beautiful running water everywhere, air conditioning by running the water over the the areas where the wind would blow. I mean, just like crazy, gorgeous cities, right? Um, that, you know, I'm not just making this up, but they're right there. You know, we have the archaeology, blah, blah, blah. But um, the, at a certain point, the Mayan people actually willingly left these cities because they realized that they were not the creator, that they were like masters of nature, you know, and they became uh, arrogant in, in some ways is what I heard. And that that they are one of the nations that just left on because they came to a point where they realized this was not, that they were not God. And the the faith that it takes to go back to the forest to live humbly, to live with humility, to live with that uncertainty that you're talking about. So it's just fascinating that I heard this story years ago. Um, and then I meet this Mayan woman who's my sister, you know, you, Karen, and how you literally left the city to go back to the forest um, with all of the faith that that takes uh, I just feel like you're really honoring your ancestors in that regard, <laughs> like <laughs> like it's in your DNA or something. It's, it's pretty miraculous because even though I was separated from my culture and I was, you know, definitely displaced, removed, and there was sh- in my family shame around being indigenous, um, even with all of that construct and separation, I always... I mean, since I was a kid, I I would ask my mom these questions like, why don't humans just stare at each other and fall like in deep love? And she'd be like, what are you talking about? (laughs) And I'd be like, but have you looked at a human's face? Like, have you looked at anyone's face? It's like a miracle. And so when I hear you speaking about this, Lila, it's interesting because it makes me think of how often I've looked at nature seen the ecosystems how they are how they work how they're designed i always used to say there's this divine design right if i i stare at a pregnant woman for long enough i could just start bawling at Mm. what a miracle Mm. that it is that there isn't anything that society cities industrialization technology there isn't anything that's going to wow me in the way that nature does and because of my connection to that there isn't anything that i'm searching for that's ever going to top that Mm -hmm. ever Mm -hmm. so all that i choose to work on is my relationship with nature so that i can be in my own nature because I am made of the same things that the tree and the, and the flowers and the bees are. And so to me, I'm not saying this is correct, but to me, while I am here, that is the highest practice that I could practice, is to be nature. Because I am. And when I think of how women birth babies... I know there's a lot they are doing, but there's a lot creators doing too. And it's a tandem dance and it's a surrender and a trust and a faith that I feel I have to have um, while I'm alive. Because otherwise, I am struggling against systems that were not made for me. So I also need to enjoy and and have fun and laugh and kiss and play and and, and like be uh, in reverence to that 
highest divine technology that already exists, was given to us, was already gifted to us. It's here and we get to like be with it. And so I think that's helped me not need to be in some rat race or system of like, get this, complete this, do this, finish this, have this. I don't care. I'm trying to be like nature. Yeah, it's amazing how we can <laughs> exhibit the the qualities and the philosophies of our ancestors even if we hadn't necessarily learned them. But I think your story of returning to Guatemala to you know, you've been there a year. Uh obviously you're back in Chumash territory now where we're sitting um aka Los Angeles area, you know, as to, to for a for a visit, but you've been in Guatemala for a year. And I think your story it, it beckons all of us, no matter who we are, uh, whether we're Diné or Muscogee or um, Menominee or, you know, Shumash or, uh, you know, Ndeh, whatever we are, you know, like, we, we have an opportunity to go back home. And, and we have an opportunity to root ourselves in the earth. You know, but then the question is like, how do we peel ourselves away from familiarity? You know, everything that we know is right here because that's what the colonizer handed us. And so to to, to go back home is an act of stepping into the unknown. Um, but you know, so you've been in Guatemala for a year. You know, what are some of what are some of the memories that stick out to you? Uh, I, I know you have a million, you know, but what are some of the things that you've learned having gone back home? I live on Lake Atitlan, uh, which is a really sacred place. And just staring at that lake and volcanoes every single day, it gives me an accountability that I've never had. Mm -hmm. It's almost like creator says, are you going to be small today or are you going to be in your grandeur? Which one is it? And it's just really clear. And then the other thing is that I've never been held the way that, that those volcanoes and lake hold me. Like, if I'm really upset or I'm confused or I'm struggling, I just go down there and get in. And I feel completely held. And I just have never really had that experience before. Um, it's also quiet you know, it's quiet. There's not, I live in a town, so I'm not in a city. So it's just quiet. I can hear myself. I can hear God better. Um, and I love the engineering of people. Like they will make anything out of anything. It's like they do not throw things away. <laughs> they completely recycle or make something new out of something. Um, and, you know, they're always growing food where they can and always helping another. It just, it just feels like a very service oriented culture. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I love like the days that I'm like crying because my bags are too heavy and I have to walk uphill and it's super confusing. And then seeing like a hundred year old woman with a ton of logs in her head, like walking faster than me, smiling <laughs> in her joy. And I'm just like, ah. Like, I'm so far behind this woman, but, um, but so grateful to, to get to have the opportunity to even look at, look in there and see what, what's inside of me, you know, that, that, um, that resonates with that. And it's nice, sorry, no, no, no. it's really nice that clothes fits me <laughs> and like, like clothes is made for my size and shape and, and also, um, Really, the undertone of, I, I mean, what I'm going to say is, is quite painful. It could trigger people. But the feeling of be more white, and I don't know how else to say that. There might be better words than what I'm using. But it's not there. I don't have to be anything. I don't have to look like anything. I don't have to talk like anything. I don't have to. I can just Los be. Los Angeles is like the most intense pressure to be not just white, but be you know glamorous and all that or beautiful or tall or oh God. whatever but um but so it's not there and not having that buzz behind everything mm. it just gives me like a relief you know mm -hmm. and um i didn't even know i needed it 
I didn't even know I needed it. Now that is some powerful words, right? And that's what's so exciting about stepping into the unknown because yeah, the unknown is scary, but when we step into the unknown, we discover things we never knew. <laughs> you know, we never could explore those dimensions of ourselves because if you're a fish living in one color of water your entire life, you don't realize that it's oppression, you know, and then you jump in another pond and you know the water doesn't have that anymore you get to feel all the years that you did spend in those other waters of oppression but you know if you for me you know like I, I'm about to move back home you know south of Gallup New Mexico and you know start taking care of sheep you know and I and I'm scared I'm scared to um, leave Albuquerque or San Francisco, which is the two main cities I've lived in throughout my life. As a Diné woman, I'm scared to leave Starbucks. Actually, there is a Starbucks in Gallup, but <laughs> but I'm scared to leave. Uh, I don't know, like the airports right there. I don't. I don't even know what I'm scared to leave. But you know, to to be out on the land with the sheep for just me and them. You know, like what is that gonna do to me? And I have a feeling it's going to be similar to you where it's like, I don't know that I'm going to find things I didn't even know I needed. You know, I, who knows what it's going to be? Maybe it's just the the joy of waking up in a quiet place surrounded by pinyon trees that have been my people's caretakers for, you know, millennia. I don't know. I have no idea. But um, I think that your story is really profound because you had that, that courage and sounds like it didn't take a lot of courage it was almost a joy almost a how could you not do it you know but to to go forward and and place yourself in a place that your ancestors revered as sacred and to just see what it does to you you know like i think it's really amazing well and you're going to find power and it's not the power that we are told or talked about, or, you know, there's fables about, uh, it's not the kind of power that is, um, man-made. It's, it's a power, the empowerment of yourself, ourselves, because that's part of this whole conversation. It's not only decolonizing, it's not only changing systems, it is empowering ourselves that we as humans are given a gift f from just being here, just being, that we have power. And that empowerment comes from within. Society is not going to give it to you. People don't know how to give it to you. you. It has to come from within. And that getting that connected to your land, to the sheep, to the trees, to that ancestry will remind you of your power will empower you to keep doing what you do because you're such a bright light and you bring so much amazingness to the world. And, and each one of us can in our unique way if we can start revering that uniqueness um, and, and sit in that power and not confuse it with the power of like money and and wealth and whatever whatever i don't know whatever we've made up that power is because it's not real power and you know speaking of the power of money you had a really interesting experience with the power of money in guatemala because obviously the u.s dollar goes a lot farther there uh what what have been some of the things you've learned about where you place your dollar there and what is the what is what kind of system is going on there uh you know that that you've been able to contribute to like reversing or at least not participating in over there yeah so this is the first time in my life that i quote unquote have money <laughs> And that's because I, I work in the un United States, so I make dollars. And then I am able to use that in another country. And the exchange rate is about 7 to 8. So right away, as any new green person would do, I started to look for where to live. 
and found that the most incredible houses were available there on the lake, on the water, all windows leading to the lake, you know, a yoga, like, hutch corner with a hammock and, like, a beautiful fireplace and, like, incredible for, like, $800 a month, which is unheard of. And so I start to see these places and I get excited because I'm like, yeah, this is great. But <laughs> but in my 31 days of just crying and getting into my humility and deeper and like not, you know, not making a move right away because everything goes slow. Everything goes slow there. So it's not like I could just roll up and, and do that. I met a family uh, and they sort of just so lovingly and in a lovely way just kind of took me in and so I started to rent a room from them a very small room for what's equivalent to almost $300 a month and I started to see what that $300 a month was doing for them I saw them be able to buy more tools for the dad's a carpenter so like more tools for his shop I saw um them getting water in a different way. I saw, I just started to see where my dollar was going. And all of the sudden I had this realization where I was like, oh, I can come here and I can colonize my own country. And because I've been taught, I know how to do that. Mm-hmm. And so then I started to look around and see how many people travel there because a lot of people travel there and the country is dependent on tourism. And and that has a really long and hard history uh, that started with a, a, a banana company in the U.S. Uh, it used to be called the Fruit Company. It's now known as Chiquita Banana. Um, but there was a, atrocities that happened in the country um, because they wanted to tear down um, tear down some of the jungle to grow bananas and then the governments got involved and then it, it turned into genocide and it killed a lot of indigenous people uh, mm. just to, to do this. And so because of that, plus many other layers of, of different moments of genocide and bad government, that the country is really dependent on tourism. It needs people to come there and visit it. So with that happening a lot of people end up staying and because people can get really nice land for less money people want to create things that they think are great like intentional communities or like you know permaculture centers things that you know quote unquote you would think are a good thing but they're not if you're not integrating the culture that lives there it's just colonizing again so um you know, I ask really hard questions. I'm like, who are the Mayan people you know? And have you asked them what they needed? And, you know, things like that. And people just look at me like I'm wild. But uh, but so I just realized. I realized, like, oh, I'm not going to move from this house. Like, I'm not going to go pay a French person or a Canadian person or someone who just landed there and had money and bought a place. And then it just made me think of how much rent I paid in the last few years and, and like, what, what that dollar was contributing to. And so all of a sudden, I was just really clear, like, no, I'm going to stay with this family and I'm going to support here with this dollar, you know. And in a way, it's it for me, it does return on an, an investment into the times that I lived in the States and I didn't, I wasn't paid properly. I wasn't, you know, I didn't, I had to have like five jobs sometimes. Like every time that it was hard, it's really nice to turn it around and see this family. There are like 10 of them to start to flourish because I can contribute in that way. Yeah. And, and it's not very much by our standards. It's like two fifty a month or something, but it's like, wildly transforming this family's experience and for just a few hundred more you could be living on the lake and you know (laughs) with your latte machine downstairs and all that but I just really appreciate how you chose to to invest in and not just invest in but create community with this local Mayan family uh, your own people you know to to create that solidarity with them um 
Unless you have anything to say on that, I had another question. Um, did you want to say anything on that first? No, I just love them. They're lovely, and it's nice to have, uh, yeah, extension of family. Yeah. Um, so, so one of my questions was like, you know, uh, you you mentioned there's shame of being indigenous within your nuclear family and your you know your immediate generations before you. Um, what was your process for undoing that shame? And and uh, learning about it and and how, where are you at in that process now? Would you say? Yeah, I think in my youth, I had a, just had a lot of questions, and I was consistently like really connected to the earth, and just felt like I don't know, like I didn't fit, I didn't fit in my nucleus, <laughs> and I was thoroughly confused. Um, I think that visiting Guatemala was that first step, seeing my family's faces, uh, seeing the country, like I said, really connecting to it. I actually found love in Guatemala as well, which was a really deep experience um, to get getting to know the culture some um, and to open my heart, obviously. Um, and then I think that after that, I did, I, I remember intentionally taking one of those DNA tests and it was a struggle because I was like, I don't want to give anyone my DNA and like it was the whole thing. But then when I took it and I actually saw what I, what I'm made up of and my percentages of being Mayan are really high and that I know that that's rare these days. Um, and my last name is Rodriguez, which is a Spanish last name. Mm-hmm. And my name is Karen, which is a very particular thing um and so i i once i saw it on the paper i i literally took it to my mom and was like look Mm -hmm. can you look at this because i think you're confused and i was never confused but this is what it is you know and my hair is like black mayan hair like it's it's (laughs) what did your mom say that you were or as maybe. She, she still had a confused mode like she was still confused like she was like what like she just like spanish or hispanic or i don't know i think that she you don't have to answer that too no she just i didn't relate to her interpretation of what an indigenous person is you know because her family did live in the city you know but but i don't think I think she didn't understand the lineage or ancestry, you know, and, and the thing is, I'm such a tree thinker, like, and that means to me, a tree can only go as high as its roots are long. So I've always been like that. Like I, I, what I create in this life could not have happened without the people before me. I'm on their shoulders at all times. And, and I'm hopefully working for the future generations after me. I'm only doing my part in a, in a, in a, in a generation long piece of work, you know? Yeah. So, so, um, my mom was still kind of quite confused and, and, you know, she didn't say much about it. There was no real reaction other than I was like, I'm clear now. And now I'm going to go look for what this means, Mm. you know? And so I just started to you know, keep reading and studying. That's when I found out about the banana company, the atrocities that happened. And I started to get just mm-hmm. more into understanding the culture and understanding, um, yeah, just who I am and where I come from and what I resonate with, mm-hmm. you know. And I still haven't visited the towns that my grandparents were born in and things like that. I'm actually visiting other Mayan towns. It's not really even, I couldn't tell you that my lineage comes from anywhere near the lake. Mm-hmm. But I do have family nearby. But it, it is, um, it's sort of right now I'm in the stage where I'm finding what I resonate with in the country. And the parts of the culture that feel familiar. And I'm just in an inquiry of like, what feels true what feels true to me and and also not dishonoring the last 40 years of my life as well there are times i wake up and i'm like man where's my latte and i'm such a california girl in that way and i can't i can't belittle myself when that happens because it is all i ever knew so i do have to hold that as well and just be like okay they're there you don't need a latte it's fine you know and like and like 
being both and being okay with being both for now until I can dig in deeper into my, you know, my truth and my elderhood. And like, that's really exciting to me because I feel like by the time I get there, I will be more true, you know. And for now, that's where I'm at. It's not quite a linear journey, but it's a regenerative journey. (laughs) And it's about recreating new and recreating life. Life begets life begets life begets life. And, And that's the type of journey I'm on. What would you say to people who have immigrated here from across these imaginary borders? Um, Obviously the most uh, atrocious of them being the Mexican-American border and the most harsh and and most symbolic and loaded border, right? It's so loaded. Um, What would you say to folks who are here now from the South, maybe from Mexico, maybe from Guatemala, El Salvador, um, maybe even uh, Abyayala, South America, you know, what would you say to them who are searching for understanding of who they are? Uh, and also, what would you say to those who aren't really searching, <laughs> who are just um, enjoying the quote unquote American dream? I would say to those searching uh, for who they are to not forget the beauty and the truth of their culture and their essence and where they come from. There's so much magic there. I mean, you say these countries and every time you said a name, I was like, oh, just I love Mexico. I love Guatemala. I love Belize. I love Honduras. I Like all the each has its own unique richness. And so, number one, don't get so disconnected from that that you forget that it's a part of you that is really delicious and beautiful. Um, And that whatever it is you're searching for here, more times than none, it is about survival or, or, you know, being able to eat and and um, while that is a real thing, and I completely have the respect for whatever it is you need to do to get there, don't forget to also enjoy your life and also and also just be gentle with yourself. Mm. And for those not searching at all, um, I would say we're not all well till we are all well. Um, and that is really true. We are not all, we are not well until we are all well. So you can think you're enjoying yourself, uh, but until you don't get involved with the, yeah, connecting, bridging, weaving, healing that has to happen right now, um, yeah, you, you, you won't, I would argue that you're not going to be as fulfilled as you could be thank you sister yes i it's such a it's such a tense uh multifaceted conversation of like our indigenous relatives uh who come from the south to uh this imaginary nation state called america you know that that my people the dene on my mom's side dene people are you know, in those imaginary boundaries. Um, and we often joke, like, if the border was just a little couple hundred miles north, I would be labeled Latina, you know. But because I'm on this side of the imaginary border, I'm Native American, you know. And really dissolving that colonial label system. And just be like, no, we are all indigenous to Turtle Island, Avia Yala, Uh, all the the hundreds of names that our various nations have for these lands, for our homelands, you know, Denebakea. And it's so intense when our relatives, as you said, for economic reasons, to just survive, to just live, or to maybe even beyond that, have have a decent, comfortable life um, that I certainly am sure I take for granted, you know, that then they come here, but then in order to come here, you have to 
become complicit with this American system, right? You have to become, uh, <laughs> you have to buy into it, you know? So there's like that tension between really understanding what relatives from the South have to do to come here to live and what it, what, what they give up and also how they accidentally reinforce systems that oppress my people, right? Like, um, I think about immigrants who come here from Iran or from, um, you know, India or from anywhere really, and basically play the game, you know, the game of going to college, making money, starting a business, you know, buying a house, but, but like, never once thinking about whose land was taken for them to be able to buy that house. Uh, never having to think about the indigenous struggle right here because they're too busy playing the American dream. And um, I've been wanting to replace that with the Turtle Island dream. You know, the Turtle Island dream is like, yes, come here, you know, find refuge, find safety, and at the very same time, be in deep solidarity with the liberation of indigenous peoples here. Because it's not Joe Biden who should be giving people permission to come here. It should be indigenous peoples themselves. You know, if you're moving to Seattle, ask the Duwamish Nation. If you're moving to LA, ask Tongva Nation. And yeah, maybe you jump through some hoops, get some stupid colonial papers that will make these police leave you alone. And I hate that that system even exists. But never forget that the real permission comes from, you know, Tongva people who live in Los Angeles, who this is still their homeland, and we're still squatting on it, no matter how, which way you fold it or cut it. And how do we be in deep solidarity? And I feel you doing that with me every day, sister, you know, to everything you've done for my people, for my work, um, and our collaborations. And so that's just my final two cents as we sign off. Um... I love you so much, sister. Is there any last words you'd like to share? I love you, and I'm super, yeah, just grateful for everything you stand for and everything you advocate for and everything you hold for your people, for all of our people. And, um, yeah, so lucky to be on this journey with you and excited for what we'll get to see in our lifetime. Um, because of the work we do. Ew! <laughs> yeah!